So this is the video in which we are finally going to write a Hello World program in Haskell. Um, we finally know enough to start talking about how to do input and output. Um, so why have we waited this long? What is the problem? So Haskell is two things in particular. Um, one is that it's lazy, right? So um, I think we've talked about this in, at various points, but it basically means that um, Values, when a Haskell program is running, values are only evaluated at the point when they're actually needed, right? And if a value is never actually used, then it will never get evaluated, okay? And um, this is really nice in a lot of ways. Um, it makes programs more, uh, more modular. Um, it's a nice source of optimizations in, 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 some, in some ways. You can have infinite data structures, um, which can be a pretty cool way of thinking about organizing data. But um, it does come with some costs as well, right? Uh, so this is, you know, great for modularity. But the downside is that it's difficult to predict uh, when things are going to be evaluated, right? Difficult to predict. And in particular, uh, the other thing that about Haskell is that Haskell is pure, and we'll see what the relationship is between these in a minute. Um, so when we say that Haskell is pure, what we mean is that uh, when you call a function with some input, uh, first of all, the function will always return the same output for the same input, and second of all, it nothing else will ever happen other than just returning the output. So like, it'll never print anything on the screen, it'll never read something from the network, it'll never generate a random number, um, it'll never do anything besides compute the output value and, and give it to you. Okay, so functions uh, don't, so the word we use for this often is they don't have any side effects. All right, and always return the same output, output for the same input. And these are very related because if you are committed, as the Haskell designers were, to having a language that was lazy, um, then you kind of, in some ways, are forced into this purity because um, laziness means that it's very difficult to predict when something's going to be evaluated. And if evaluating things can cause side effects to happen, such as things getting printed on the screen, right, then it's very difficult to know exactly in what order things are going to get printed on the screen because it depends on the order that things get evaluated. Um, and it would be very difficult to write a program in such a way that you can control you know, when things are going to happen uh, and what things get printed on the screen. Um, because even the order that things happen may depend on some compiler optimizations happening. Um, the compiler is kind of free to reorder things that don't depend on each other however it likes. And so um, that makes it very difficult to control. Uh, if you could have sort of arbitrary side effects happening. So uh, Haskell is both of these things. But so this put the designers of Haskell in a little bit of a pickle because, um, of course, you want your language to be able to sometimes do, to have side effects, to like print something to the screen or read from the network or read from the disk or write a file or whatever. And so the question is, how are they going to, you know, combine these things? Um, so problem, how do we actually have side effects, right, like, you know, writing to the screen or disk, reading from network, you know, generating random numbers when we actually want it, when we want them. So. Uh, here is the solution that um, Haskell designers came up with. Um, so there is a type called IO, so a value of type IOA is, think of it as a computation that uh, does two things. So a computation which, first of all, can have or can possibly have some side effects like printing to the screen, reading from the disk, etc. And two, uh, it returns a result of type A. 
okay? Um, and essentially what these are, and what I think of these is, right, uh, it is a first class imperative program. So it's a little imperative program that I can pass around my Haskell program just like I can pass functions around and stuff like that. So it's not necessarily clear uh, how this helps, right? Because I just said that we can't have this because it makes it difficult to control, and then I just said, oh, we're going to throw it in. But this level of indirection is actually the key. Um, that we don't just say, oh, any function can return, you know, and do any old thing that it wants. We say, no, specifically, um, side effects are going to be described by values of this uh, IOA type. And so, um, Think of it like, think of a value of type IOA like a recipe. So imagine you have a recipe for cake, right? And there is a big distinction between having a recipe and having a cake, right? So a recipe, the recipe itself is just like a little piece of paper um, and it has some instructions written on it, right? Uh, reading the piece of paper doesn't make anything happen. Um, if I give you the piece of paper, nothing happens. We can like store the piece of paper in a data structure like a little box of recipe cards. We can combine it with other pieces of paper like maybe I have a recipe for cake and a recipe for frosting and I take them both and I write them down on a like bigger recipe card for making a cake with frosting. Um, I can do all these things and it's all completely pure and fine. I'm just computing functions. I'm not like making anything happen. But of course if I take that recipe and execute it, Right then, like the oven gets hot, and like I use up flour, and um, you know I bake a cake, and I actually produce a cake. Okay, so um, and I should right, I should have said I've missed out a very important word. This is a computation which, uh, when executed, okay. So we're making a distinction between executing something and evaluating it. So evaluating something is just like seeing what value it is. That would be like reading your recipe card. Um, and executing it means actually following the instructions that are written on the recipe card or following the instructions in an IOA computation in this case that will actually like make some effects happen. Okay. Um, and uh, so there is a special value called main which has type IO unit and uh, when you compile a Haskell program, the Haskell runtime system basically looks for a function, uh, a, it's not a function, a value of this type and will take it and execute it. So uh, for example, we can, so here we can write our first hello world program. So there is a, there is a function called put strlin that has this type. So it takes a string as input and returns an IO computation which when executed will print that cause that string to be printed on the screen and then it'll return an uninformative unit value right so I could say put Sterling hello world okay and when I load this up and uh, the GHCI uh, is special in that uh, if you put in a value of type IO something, it will actually execute it for you, but um, so there we go. It executed it and did hello world. And you know, we could actually compile this and we would get an executable that when we run that executable, it's going to print hello world on the screen. Okay. Um, and uh, there is a whole little language provided of combinators for kind of putting together more complex IO computations out of simpler ones. But actually a lot of this language we've already seen. So for example, um, IO is a functor. So that means I can do things like, let's see, um, so there's another function called uh, get line that has type, sorry, I said function. It's not a function. It is a value of type IO string which is just an IO computation which, when executed, will uh, actually wait for some input from standard input and then return that as a string. So uh, let's show that in action. Um, well, I'll call it read int 
I'll make an io int. And what read int does is I'm going to do get line. That has type io string. I want an io int. So I'm going to take a function from string to int. Uh, in particular, there's a function called read, which can turn a string into whatever you want, basically. And I'm going to fmap that over get line. Right, so read is string to int, and this is io string, so then I fmap it, I get an io int. So this is now the io computation, which when executed will wait for the user to type something, and then run the read function on whatever they typed and return the, the result as an int. So, um, you know, I can say read int. It's going to wait for me to type something, and then it, you know, return that same thing that I typed. As output, um, you know, or we could make a, a an IO computation add ints. So add ints. Uh, actually, okay, hang on. We need something else before we do that. So uh, IO is also applicative. Um, right. So pure. So this means we have pure, right? You can guess that pure makes uh, an IO computation that does no IO and just returns A. And app, sorry, A to B. Uh, app, right, it runs the two, so this, this IOB computation that you get when executed will basically first execute this and then execute this and then return the result of applying this function to that A. So the effects or the, the side effects that happen in this computation are kind of sequencing all the side effects that happen in here plus all the ones that happen in here. So, um, right, so this sequence is the effects from the first and second computations. It's right, this is a way to compose, like remember when I, I made the, the uh, analogy of making a, if I had a recipe for cake and a recipe for frosting and I wanted to combine them into a bigger recipe for frosted cake, right? This is what this is doing. This is a way of com composing, combining two IO computations into a bigger one. Um, that kind of does both and then combines their outputs in some appropriate way, in this case by applying a function to an argument and combines their outputs. So for example, so we can do our add ints example now because uh, I want to do read int twice but I want to take their outputs and apply a function to them, in particular I want to apply the plus function and so we can do that using the same kind of pattern that we've seen before Let's say do both of these, and then we're going to sequence together their effects. It's going to read one, and then read another int, and then combine their outputs using this plus function. And so if I were to run this one, if I execute it, um, it's going to wait for me to type some numbers, so 2, and then I'm going to type 5, and it read them both in and added them up and output 7. Um, right, or we could do something like... Um, uh, we'll call this greet. Right, greet says first it does put Sterlin hello, and then this is the and then operator. It's gonna, I'm uh, sorry, we'll call it instead of calling it greet, we'll call it ask name. Okay, so it first prints out hello, and then it says, you know. But Sterling, what is your name? Actually, I'm going to just do put stir. So put stir just doesn't put a new line at the end. And then finally, we're going to run get line. So again, we're using the applicative instance because the applicative instance is what gives us this combinator that lets us run things in sequence. But in this case, I'm just ignoring the output of this because it's just returning an uninformative unit. I'm ignoring the output of this, and I'm going to eventually return the output value from this get line. Um, so if I do this one, ask name, it says, hello, what is your name? Dr. Yorgi. And then it just returns 
my name as a string. Okay. Um, you know, maybe as one other final example, we could say, you know, uh, print lines. This is going to take a list of strings and be an IO computation that's going to print each of the strings in the list on a line by itself. So how are we going to do that? Well, we're going to use our traverse function. Um, so I want to call it L's for lines. I'm going to traverse and use some function uh, on my list L's. And the function I want to apply is uh, put strlin. OK, so put strlin right, takes a string. And I'm going to apply it to each of these things. Again, this uh, we've seen this before. We, this doesn't quite match because now we're going to get a list of all the units that come out of the put strlin calls. But so I can just say, OK, after that, let's just return a pure unit. Um, and so if I say print lines, hello. And it prints all the lines out. Um, incidentally, um, it turns out this is such a common pattern of doing something like a traverse um, and then just ignoring its output and doing a pure unit that um, uh, there's a special function call it for it called traverse underscore. However, we have to uh, import data.foldable. I won't bother saying what that is right now. You can go look it up if you want. We might talk about it later. But, um, it does the same thing as traverse, but it ignores all the outputs and just returns a unit at the end. Um, so that does the same thing. 